Great. Okay. Uh, welcome back. I hope everybody had an excellent lunch. You're all fueled up for this afternoon's content. My name is Nicole. I am a first year law student here. Um, so I'm very excited to announce our next panel. Um, so we'll be talking about the implementation of platform regulation in Europe. This should build really nicely off of this morning's panel where Julie Brill concluded that we should learn from the EU work that's been done in this area. So now is a really good chance for us to all learn a bit about that. Um, so with that, I will hand it off to David Sullivan, who's the Executive Director of Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, and he will be the moderator for this panel. Thanks very much. Welcome back, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, moderating what I think is a truly exceptional panel that has been uh, sort of... Um, uh, inaugured with so many references to the import and consequence of developments on the regulatory front uh, in Europe in, Europe in uh, uh, the recent period. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce our panel. Um, going down the line here, we have Emma Lanzo, uh, who directs the Free, uh, Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, Gerard de Graff, uh, who I need to apologize for uh, mispronouncing his uh, Dutch <laughs> name, um, who is uh, the Senior Envoy for Digital to the United States and head of the new EU office in San Francisco, um, part of the EU delegation to the United States. Uh, and then at the end, we have Chris Riley, uh, who wears a number of hats in this space, but is here as a distinguished research fellow at the Annenberg uh, Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and is also leading a new initiative called the Data, Tr Data Transfer Initiative that he's going to be telling us about. And then uh, we should be joined virtually by Julie Owono, who is the Executive Director of Internet Sans Frontieres, as well as a member of the Meta Oversight Board. Uh, I think we're, hopefully we'll make that connection happen and she'll join our conversation due course. Um, so when it comes to um, uh, uh, platform regulation in Europe, um, there is a long list uh, of initiatives, regulations, and directives that have taken shape over the last few years. Um, uh, those that are very uh, well known here in the United States just by their acronym, like the GDPR, and some that will soon be very well known, the Digital Services Act uh, and the Digital Markets Act, which is what we're gonna focus our uh, comments on uh, and discussion on today. Um, so uh, Gerard has previously worked at the European Commission for I think 30 years, uh, now, including on the development of the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. He is, uh, I think uh, I learned recently, uh, Henry Kissinger is credited with this quip that he may or may not have actually said about when I want to talk to Europe, who do I call? The answer for the tech industry is Gerard. Uh, <laughs> and so we're delighted to have him here to tell us about the state of EU platform regulation and to kick off the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, David. It's, it's really nice to be here. And when I say here, it's not just in Colorado, here in Boulder, with beautiful, I mean, still snow, et cetera, but it's here in the U.S., I arrived some five months ago because the European Union decided to set up an office in San Francisco and then asked me to, to head it. And, and it's been a, a fascinating ride so far, very uh, interesting and, and positive. Um, I, I'm very pleased also to be here because the quality of the debate is incredibly high. I mean, how fortunate we are to, to, to have these kind of excellent panels uh, and, and, and excellent uh, discussions. Uh, I mean, this, this uh, kind of, we, we need more of those and we need more of those also in, in Europe. Uh, Senator Bennett, I mean, I was very impressed by, by, by what he said. He talked about we're in a crisis. And if you look at Europe, I mean, we're in multiple crises. Uh, we're in a security crisis. We're in a democracy crisis. We're in an economic crisis, in an energy crisis, in a climate crisis. And we're in a digital crisis. And what you expect of your political leadership is when, say, your continent and the world is in crisis, they need to stand up and show leadership, why we have elected them in the first place. And I, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm partisan here, but I think in Europe, this leadership is standing up. And also to say that kind of the digital, which is a priority in the European Union, it remains a priority because often, of course, what happens is other crises come and then it's forgotten. Priorities get shifted, but, but not here. And I think overall, and we talked about that, Senator Bennett talked about that a bit earlier, we as democracies, because we've got a democracy crisis, democracy is under threat. We have to show that democracies offer better solutions to our citizens, a higher quality 
of life, better protections than the non-democracies, the authoritarian states. So there's a lot at stake here. This is a very important debate uh, that we need to have. And, and there's a lot of positive about tech platforms and the internet, and we recognize that in, in Europe. And so we're going to maybe focus a bit more on the dark side, but we must not forget that there's a lot that kind of our, our economy could not do without big techs. I mean, we could not kind of, uh, as, as citizens, uh, kind of interact with our friends and, and, and kind of uh, lead a meaningful life without, without the internet. But I think the romanticist view of the internet, I think that's something that we are now leaving behind. And, and so, I mean, I also heard a bit, I mean, on, the, on the kind of, can you give this to an agency or to, I mean, in, in, in Europe, just no politician would ever give these responsibilities to an agency. Uh, they would set a framework, they would set kind of like what, what, what that powers that agency should have, what the agency should do and not do. And so you, you can't just delegate these issues to, to, to unelected officials. That would be the line in Europe. And, and the same, you can't just leave it to the courts. I mean, very interesting what's going to happen at the Supreme Court, but European politicians would not be comfortable with the idea that the court is going to kind of set the direction of the policy. This is something that the politicians have been elected to, to do. Now, maybe just now go into what is Europe doing, European platform regulation. We asked ourselves two questions, or actually three, and I think many of these questions are asked by people around the world, is how do we make the internet safer and how do we protect and reinforce our fundamental rights and freedom of expression? That's a, the question that European politicians, citizens, NGOs, industry have asked themselves. And the answer to that question is the DSA, at least the Digital Service Act. It's part of the answer to the, the question, not, not all of the answer to the question. The other question we've asked ourselves, and it came up earlier this morning, is how can we make sure in a situation when there's network effects and economies of scale, that these digital markets remain competitive, that if you are like a, a new company, you're a startup, you've got superior technology, you have a chance to get a mar fair market share. You can grow, you can succeed, you can yourself maybe dislodge at some point these powerful companies. So that's the second question that the European Union has asked itself. And the answer to that question is the Digital Markets Act. And then the third question is, is I think relevant also here, how do we avoid fragmentation? Because if the European Union doesn't regulate, well, I mean, the, Europe, the member states will and do. And then you get a bit the situation that you see here, increasingly in the US, you get a very fragmented market, a patchwork. And if there's one reason, I often get the question, why do you have so few, say, big platforms in the European Union? There's many reasons for this. But one is it's just very difficult to grow in the European Union if the rules are different between the member states. Because if you're successful in the Netherlands, you go to Germany, you've got to change your business model. You go from Germany, you go to France, again, you change your business model. It takes a lot more time and it is much more costly. The first person you need to hire in Europe if you're going to expand is a lawyer. And you don't want to hire a lawyer. With all respect here to the lawyers, but you want to hire <laughs> an engineer. So, so where are we? I mean, 205 days. Then the Digital Services Act will enter into application. Less than a year, or about a year, for the Digital Markets Act. Well, give you, I mean, ask David, how much do people know about the European framework? And I mean, maybe you underestimated your, well, certainly not your intelligence, but certainly the kind of the, the information you have. He said not much. So please start with chapter one. So I'll start with chapter one. <laughs> How do you, I mean, what is the DSA, the Digital Services Act, that will become and is becoming quite a well-known acronym, not just in, in Europe, US, but, but around the world? It is a, an effort to make the platforms more accountable, more responsible. And we do that by imposing a certain set of obligations. We call these due diligence obligations. And these due diligence obligations are intended to give us confidence, all of us, that these big platforms have sit systems in place that kind of avoid or, or uh, kind of prevent problems from happening and detect them and then mitigate them. So we, we take a systemic approach. Right? It's a bit like how banking regulators regulate banks. I mean, there are problems. There are bad loans. There is some mis-selling going on. There's money laundering. What a regulator looks at, the financial supervisor looks at, do, does the bank have systems in place? 
solvency systems, risk management systems, audit systems, etc., that minimize these problems. So that's the approach that the European Union is taking. We don't regulate speech, we regulate systems. We want to be confident that these companies have thought about these issues and, and act. And we do it in an asymmetric way. So we don't impose the same rules on everybody. If you're big, you're powerful. I think somebody used the term, you are a public square. Yeah, so your powers are actually systemic. You should shoulder many more obligations than if you're a small or a non-user facing. If you're part of like the basement of the internet, you don't need to be kind of having uh, or carrying so many obligations. So what are these obligations? Well, terms and conditions, they need to be simple. I have never read terms and conditions of, of a platform before I sign up. I've never. There's an opera in Germany. It's about two and a half hours opera where they sing the terms and conditions of Facebook. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe the music is very good, but I, I, would, I wouldn't go necessarily to listen to it. But we are asking that these to be simple, also simple for minors, for example, so that they can understand what they're signing up to legal representative, reporting transparency. There is so little we know about these platforms, which is a big challenge for us as regulators. What do we know about how their algorithms work, how they kind of moderate content? There's little we know. Bring it out, bring it out in the open. Notice an action. If I see something, if European users see something, they should be able to notify the platform. There's a problem. You look into this. I think it's illegal. Check it. And then the platform kind of comes under an obligation to act. We call it notice and action. Not necessarily to remove, to, to check it out. Because also in Europe, we have, we have our own section 30, 230, but it is conditional liability exemption. There is a knowledge standard. So as soon as you get information from somebody, there might be something illegal on your platform. You can be liable if you don't act expeditiously. So it triggers the liability. So notice and action will make these platforms much more sensitive to what happens, but also to protect our fundamental rights. So because we are very concerned about over removal. Uh, so they need to kind of, if they remove something that you've posted, the prime minister of the Netherlands is an idiot, which I don't, I, I don't agree with. <laughs> But I can say, if I want to, under my freedom of speech, they cannot remove that. They have to tell me we're removing it on those and those grounds, and then we have to say, we'll put it back, because this is my exercising my free speech. Well, there's more risk uh, assessment. You see a lot of these terms actually come from the banking regulation. We've looked very carefully at banking regulations, so know your business customer, your Amazon, your third-party sellers, check them out, that they're not going to rip off your, your customers. The, the risk management, look at what risks your systems pose for mental health, for minors, for violence, gender-based uh, violence, for kind of many other, I mean, for disinformation, for kind of election interference. Check that out. And then have, and publish it, make it, make it public. Access to, to researchers, so researchers should be able to go in and check, which is, which is very important, uh, because they, they have all this knowledge and, and they can find out things that we as general citizens or, or policymakers will not find out. External independent audit, let an auditor go in and check all these systems and give them a clean bill of health or, or notice if there's problems. Crisis protocols, if we get in these exceptional situations like we've just lived through with the Russian invasion in Ukraine and you see a lot of disinformation uh, driven by, by, by Russia. What are they doing? This is not a normal routine situation. How are they going to step up their content moderation? So that's the, the Digital Services Act. <laughs> VLOPs, very large online platforms, think about this. We are going to designate, the European Union will designate VLOPs. We think there'll probably be 20, 25, maybe 30. That those are the big tech companies which will be under the full set of due diligence obligations. So they're about 18 to, to 20. I'm, I'm just going to speed up the Digital Markets Act. <laughs> gatekeepers, that's the term there. Asymmetric, this piece of legislation only applies to gatekeepers, to nobody else. There'll be 10 or 15. For different services, they'll be designated as gatekeepers. It's essentially do's and don'ts. We think in Europe that competition policy is not enough. We need ex ante measures. We need to intervene before. We need to define what are unfair practices. You come and you can compete in the European Union, but not by kind of moving the goalpost or, or tripping up your opponent. I mean, we don't accept that in sports. We shouldn't accept that in, 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 in commerce. So we are setting out a number of do's and don'ts, don't self-preference, don't 
tie a consumer or a user into kind of different services. I mean, don't put, impose MFN clauses. I mean, open up your walled gardens, allow site loading. So if you're an app store, people who kind of want to download apps, they shouldn't just be downloading, allowed to download it from your app store. You should be able to download it from competing app stores or even from the internet. So there's a lot of these interoperability of personal uh, messenger services. So if you have WhatsApp, should be possible to send messages to people who are not on WhatsApp, but on other personal messenger services. So that's the DMA, I think enough for today. Just very quickly on the global, I mean, we are regulating for Europe. Uh, so we are basically requiring these companies and many of them are in the US, but not all of them to comply with European rules. We don't regulate for the world. We don't certainly not regulate for the, for the United States. But of course, a lot of countries are looking at what the European Union as well. I mean, we've had, I don't know where Tim Wu is, but we've had very, very in-depth discussions when I was still in Brussels about the DSA and the DMA. So there'll be a, a global effect. We call that the Brussels effect. We would like to see more also of a Washington effect, but we're not yet seeing it. And many countries, half of the time, I was in, involved very much in the negotiations of the DSA and the D DMA, half of the time was spent talking to third countries from Japan, South Korea, Australia, Canada, US, uh, Latin America. Of course, we need to show it, it works. Uh, so this is, it, it's, it's nice on the books. People kind of generally like what's on the books. Now we have to make sure that in practice it, it works. For the world, we have three models at the moment in terms of internet governance. We have a human centric model. I'd like to think it's a European model. We have a more laissez faire model, which is the American model. Although I think it in terms in terms of direction, there's a lot of support for the human-centric model, but it's not possible politically to turn that into action for reasons which we discussed this morning, and I think we all know. And the third is an authoritarian repressive model. If we look at the world, a lot of countries are now kind of asking themselves the same questions that the European Union asked itself five years ago, the, the questions I mentioned. We want these countries, or at least most of them, to join the European, I like to think European, US model rather than the Chinese, Russian, Turkish model. So there is a lot at stake. We don't want kind of, I mean, we want to protect democracy and we think that the DSA and the DMA are important tools to, to achieve that. We have a declaration for the future of the internet, which we worked on together with the White House. Tim had a great role in that. So there's, uh, there's more at stake than just the, the EU. Leave it here. I hope I did not abuse. You can t subtract some of that time from, from the <laughs> Gerard, interventions I have. Maybe I just given up all the opportunity. My yeah, this is a terrific question. Uh, yeah. Crash course on the sort of uh, the European um, platform regulation regime, and really tease up. I think some of the themes we want to unpack. Whether that is moving to implementation. What does that look like? What are the lessons uh, from the European experience? Um, thinking about fragmentation. Uh, and then what are the, uh, the risks and opportunities for the rest of the world uh, as these regulations come into effect? We also have some keywords that I think people will start to pick up on, systemic risk, uh, gatekeepers, uh, very large online platforms. Um, so uh, let me also welcome Julie Awono joining us virtually. Uh, Julie, I'm glad the technology has allowed you to join us. Uh, looking forward to you joining the conversation. Um, but now I want to turn to uh, Emma um, uh, to really um, talk about the, the opportunities and challenges in the viewpoint of civil society. Um, you know, where and civil society is not is never a monolith. <laughs> um, but where do you see the sort of opportunities as well as maybe those challenges for folks looking to hold both um, governments and companies accountable and, and to make them more transparent uh, when it comes to uh, online speech in particular. Yeah, thank you, David. And thank you to everyone for um, such a great set of conversations so far. Um, and yes, if there's one thing I've learned in years working in civil society, it's you never claim to speak for all of civil society. Um, but I would say, I think in general, and if you look at the kind of statements across a lot of EU-based civil society organizations in particular, there's a sense of, I think, cautious optimism um, with sometimes a lot more effort, emphasis on the caution than the optimism. Um, but 
I think people have been generally welcoming of the Digital Services Act, in part because through a lot of advocacy in the many years that, uh, that the act was under development, um, it really does have a focus on human rights as the core kind of goal and, and driving motivation of the regulation. Um, and it carries through important elements of the prior intermediary liability framework in the European Union, the e-commerce directive, um, including, for example, the prohibition against general monitoring obligations. Um, that's basically the, uh, the, the longstanding EU prohibition on filtering mandates um, and on the, uh, the idea that intermediaries could be required to filter content. Um, that's always a top priority for civil society organizations, especially free expression advocates, um, because we know that if there are legal mandates for companies to filter content, that is going to lead to overbroad removal, blocking, restriction of lawful um, protected speech. So I think there were some elements elements ported over from the e-commerce directive uh, that were kind of core to that legal framework um, that made it through to the DSA. Um, also the new elements that Gerard was talking about of, of a lot more mandatory transparency from tech companies of all sizes, um, including the uh, kind of extensive risk assessments that very large online platforms and very large online search engines will have to, um, to put in place. So a lot of things that I think civil society is welcoming of and we're seeing you know could be put to a lot of different kinds of use for um, holding online services accountable for how they impact users rights but i also think a lot of this is going to bear out the, the kind of the pros and cons of the dsa will bear out in the implementation of it the proof will be in the pudding um, because the, i think the, the shorthand version of gerard's overview of what's in the dsa is basically any idea you can think of or that you have heard of in the past four or five years about how one might regulate online platforms is probably reflected somewhere in the DSA, right? It's really trying to cover everything from systemic risk assessment to transparency, but also kind of core intermediary liability questions about liability for illegal content. It's got elements in about users challenging companies for wrongful takedown of their speech under terms of service. Um, it's, it's really a lot of the different ideas that we've heard here in the US discussed about how you might hold companies accountable. Um, and, and there's a framework now in Europe that tries to fit all of those pieces together. But exactly how those pieces fit together, I think is where we're really going to see um, how the DSA ultimately affects users' rights. So going back to this idea of the prohibition against general monitoring, it's great to have that written in text in an article in the DSA. But there are a lot of elements in the DSA where the idea of filtering, if not legal mandates for filtering, at least a, a strong encouragement of companies to do more filtering might come into play, including through those things like the, the risk assessments. When online services do risk assessments, they're, going, they're asked in the text of the legislation to look at the risks that their services could be used to distribute illegal content or what impact their services will have on civic discourse or minors mental health or online gender based violence, a lot of different very content focused concerns. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways you could approach a risk assessment analysis there and a lot of different outcomes that companies might reach in conclusion about kind of the risks that their systems pose. But the big question is also how will regulators respond? Will they think that whatever mitigation mechanisms that um, different services describe and put forward are adequate, or will we see responses from regulators that push more towards, you should just be systematically blocking this sort of content. You should be systematically removing it from your services. Um, I, I hope that the text of the DSA with that prohibition against general monitoring would be a strong signal to regulators that you know, filtering is not the tool that they should necessarily expect online services to implement to mitigate risks. But all that's going to have to be negotiated. All of that is going to, I think, in the next couple of years, really bear out in the, the conversations that we see in the systemic oversight aspects of the DSA between platforms and regulators, and ideally with a strong role for civil society to kind of continue informing those conversations. So a lot more we could talk about, but I'll, I'll stop there for now. No, that I think, you know, really uh, sets the scene in terms of just uh, just how much there is there and how much uh, the implementation of this, which is what I want to get turned to Chris uh, to talk a little bit about. So uh, and this is with regard to both uh, the DSA as well as the DMA when it comes to competition and these uh, the, the restrictions on gatekeepers here. We're really, um, I think, moving from 
uh, you know, I think it was mentioned a couple times this morning, this morning the notion that, techno that tech companies and internet companies have not been a regulated industry. And now that is changing. Uh, and so what kind of relationship do we want to see between the regulators um, in Brussels in this case and, uh, and other member states and the regulated um, to actually implement some of these requirements and, and, and see how this actually sort of starts to take shape? Chris. Thanks. To, to get into that, uh, what the relationship should be, let me walk through what I see as the steps ahead over the next few years for this. Um, and I want to tease out one thing that Gerard said and one thing that Emma said as precursors to that that are very well articulated. Um, Gerard said these are not regulations for the EU, but these are GDPR level, in my opinion, in terms of the global echoes that they will have. I've been saying that for years about the DSA. Increasingly, I think that's be true of the DMA as well. Um, I think of this as sort of the start of a, oh, I'm sorry, Emma's, Emma's point. Um, well, I'll get to that in a second. I think of this as a three-stage process. I call the stage we're in now stage zero. You have to pass the laws. We have passed the laws. They are on the road to being adopted and implemented. And um, both the DMA and the DSA include provisions in them designed for sort of forward-looking flexibility. Right. This is a generic, I'm, just, I'm using a euphemism here, but um, I think this is a feature, not a bug. It's needed to reach the goal that Gerard articulated of accountability, um, and Emma's comments articulated, I think, quite a lot of examples of this, ways in which the DSA, um, the proof is yet to be in the pudding about how that will work out in practice. As a result of these, I think, intentional design decisions, the EU is doing what I believe it should do, which is not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, where it knows the contours of what it wants to have happen, put it in the law, build out future processes to advocate further. That takes us to stage one, which is the next stage. From the governance perspective, stage one, which we're in right now, hosts multi-stakeholder conversations, expert roundtables, dig into each of the specific issues that needs to be implemented within these laws. For the DSA, I know the European Commission is working on conversations around crisis protocols and that they've had at least one conversation around risk assessment and how you start to elaborate on some of practice. Similarly, the DMA context, the European Commission is holding a number of uh, public multi-stakeholder conversations. The next one coming up on February 27th is on the language within the DMA that requires interoperability for messaging applications. So having these kind of, kind of conversations from the government perspective allows them to draw a number of perspectives in and puts them in a place for that next phase. Now, stage one from the advocate's perspective, which I think is equally important to look at as well, is to engage with these processes and develop and offer solutions that attempt to realize the goals of the, of the legislation that are workable, right? All too often stage one from the advocate's perspective is, I don't, I don't like this, we need to figure out how to shut down the part of it we want. And I mean, there's a place for that in, in lots of different circumstances. But I always like to emphasize the, the place in stage one of coming to the table with constructive ideas and how you engage with that. So a brief sidebar before I get to stage two on, on my work and the things that I'm doing in that space. So David mentioned, thank you, the, the newly uh, created data transfer initiative. Um, this is set up as a, as a sort of continuation of an established effort called the Data Transfer Project, which was put together by a few technology companies to build tools to take advantage of data portability obligations and mandates to directly connect your data as a user from one service to another. So if you want to get your photos out of Facebook and into Google Photos, you don't have to go into an export tool, download it over what may be a very slow or mobile or satellite internet connection to a device that may not have storage available for it, and then upload at the other end and cross your fingers and hope that it works. But you can click one link and have those photos go in the back end. Um, so I, I get the, uh, uh, I think, exciting opportunity to try to build more of these tools. And this is part of that stage one process for one very small piece of the DMA. Article six, uh, paragraph nine of the Digital Markets Act requires data portability to be offered by the very large platforms continuously and in real time and to include data not just contributed by the user, but also about the user. So I offer this as an example to say, there are a lot of details that need to be worked out, and we need a lot of efforts like the one that I'm doing on all of these different pieces to bring their expertise to the table, to work with the commission, to translate this into the next stage. So stage two is the subsequent legislation and rulemaking that will come from the European Commission, the processes that are put in place to, to enforce these and implement these in practice and in details. From the advocate's perspective, that's implementation of functional pieces of what is effectively, if all goes well, a co-regulatory model of governance. So it's pieces that you can build out. So I'm putting on my other hat now, my Annenberg hat, where I've had the, the pleasure of working with former FCC Commissioner Susan Ness, well known to many in the Silicon Flatirons community, on what we call modularity, 
which is a, an overarching framework to bridge these collaborations together. Um, we recognize that as the DSA is passed, as the UK looks at its online services bill, as the US moves forward something, as New Zealand, Canada, and other jurisdictions move these things forward, there are a lot of these fine-grained implementation operational tasks that will be common across these laws. So how can we go one step further at implementing these and not only try to really bring in expertise from, from one other uh, stakeholder segment, but from different countries as well as a means of helping the commission implement its law by taking some of these tasks, the, the ones that we've used in the past a lot are platform to researcher data access mandates an important part of the Digital Services Act. There's a step in that for vetting researchers. Now we would never say that our goal is to take away the commission's ability to enforce that law and to imply its guidelines in the way that it sees fit. But if we can help make it a little bit easier, set up a process that does some of the legwork of that vetting according to a standard or a set of guidelines, we think there's a lot of work to be done in that bridging from stage one of the seeking lots of input to stage two and how we apply these things. So just to recap very briefly, stage zero laws are adapted. I think one of the reasons why we're having these conversations around Europe is that they just went ahead and passed the laws. <laughs> stage one, conversations are happening with lots of different perspectives and stakeholders and we're trying to build these different structures together. And then finally, there will be subsequent rules and guidance that come out um, that in my opinion, I hope support a lot of collaborative work both within and without government agencies. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so you have to pass a law yes. <laughs> to start the process, yes. one of the key takeaways. So we've talked already, and Gerard has mentioned the, the Brussels effect, uh, and that, you know, whether it is actually in the US Congress, where bills were introduced last year that uh, looked a lot like some of the provisions of the Digital Services Act um, to many countries around the world that have also started to look at some of these similar methods. And um, Chris, I think, eloquently spoke to the need of thinking about how can these kind of uh, types of regulatory requirements acry, apply across jurisdictions. Um, I want to turn now to Julie. Um, thank you so much for joining us. You've done a tremendous amount of work um, advocating and thinking about um, how these kinds of regulations play out in other parts of the world. And you've also looked at the uh, individual decisions made by one particularly important platform uh, through your role with the oversight board. Um, so uh, how do you, would you say the EU regulations in this space and particularly the Digital Services Act are being perceived around the world? And what do you see as the, the um, opportunity there for a more human rights-based approach to content regulation? <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, David. I wanted, first of all, to thank Silicon Flight Irons for allowing me to join you uh, virtually. Uh, unfortunately, for personal reasons, I wasn't able to travel. Um, but I, to, to respond to your question, to your first question on the, the you know, the potential international effects uh, to which Carol has already, you know, alluded to in his initial remarks, um, I would say that there has been definitely a shift. We all remember uh, in 2018, when Germany was the first ever European country taking the lead on uh, adopting a set of a regulation with regards to online speech. And at the time, uh, there was a lot of criticism. Um, one, one of the reasons for the criticism, it's because this particular regulation had been praised by uh, leaders such as Vladimir Putin. I don't think you want to be praised by Putin. I don't think it's a good sign, but uh, that's the, we can discuss that. Um, and now here we are, fast forward five, six years later, and we have this um, very robust piece of legislation, pieces of legislation, uh, it's, it's a whole uh, ensemble, uh, a piece, pieces of legislation that uh, like, um, Emma rightly reminded us is a very, uh, th the most comprehensive uh, document that summarizes basically what, you know, the principles and values that many organizations, many stakeholders, uh, governments, and, and also companies, but also civil society organizations have thought in the past six, seven, six to five years that these are important to preserve a democratic online space where freedom of speech and human rights in general are the principle uh, and, and where safeguards exist. So I do think, I really do believe that uh, this, this regulation will uh, kind of help repair some of the the errors that have been made in the past uh, because of the urgency we were facing with dealing with very novel issues uh, that that brought so much change in a, in a very short amount of time. Now, on the on the issue of you know how this could 
help impulse or support uh, uh, an impulse for further protection of human rights online. I, I really truly believe that this is still that it's going to be the case with the DSA and the DMA, provided, of course, that as you rightly said, Chris, we really look into the details and make sure that we give a body, we give we give flesh to all these very beautiful principles and 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 and, and, and values that we've summarized in the DSA and DMA. Um, but I, I want to speak specifically because you you asked me about it, David, and I think it's it's a good opportunity to, to talk about that. When it speaks specifically about uh, the, the way some initiatives could uh, absolutely not only inspire themselves from the from the the DSA and the DMA, but also could provide some um, some of the flesh that I was just talking about. You know, what does it look like to have um, uh, mechanisms for to redress? the rights of users whose speech has been unjustly deleted from, from platforms. And that's absolutely what been, we've been doing at the Oversight Board for the past almost three years now. Um, we have been trying to, sh to model or to offer uh, some, some answers to some of the big questions. How do you, how do, you do that at scale, in the same scale as uh, the, the, the content that we are seeing every day being published on those platforms? How do, you do, how do you do that? How do you offer mitigation to human rights violation in a way that, that is not interested in, in business, that is to totally devoid of any business consideration, uh, but that really plays at heart the rights of the users and particularly their, their uh, human rights. Um, and to that, uh, I would say that the, the, the oversight board, although this is absolutely not a way to say this, uh, you know, the grand solution, uh, absolutely not. Uh, but, but we have been trying a lot of, a lot of things uh, and, and in, in the recent years, uh, not working just among us, among ourselves, but really uh, collaborating, uh, including with European authorities, to uh, you know better understand this this environment where we were we are evolving, uh, better understand what what type of answers that we have uh, proposed can be interested uh, to integrate or to look at when trying to implement the uh, the Digital Services Act in 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 the month and years to come. And I and I really do believe that. Um, th these parallels between the DSA framework, uh, specifically on you know the, the 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 ability for users to seek redress from platforms from very large platforms, there are parallels between the DSA framework and our role at the at the oversight board, which is fundamental rights are at the at the heart and at the forefront of all the board's decision. Uh, if you look at them, I really encourage you to do that when, when you have time. Uh, you will always see an international human rights analysis of what is at stake, not only with regards to the policy of the company, but also with regards more largely with the way that po the policy of the company and the company itself has enforced or protected the set for the mental rights. Um, at the same time, we know there are concerns. And uh, I think Emma, rightly remind, reminded us of, of, of many of them. Um, one of our big concern, I would say, uh, at, at the OSB and I personally, uh, as a human rights and free expression advocate, is the issue of over-enforcement uh, and removal of content, which should not be, precisely because companies do not want to face or will not want to face uh, potential, potential liability for things that it may, may have let uh, available on platforms. Um, there is also the issue of, uh, you know, adapting this model based on the, the size of the company, of course, based on the ability of the company to uh, invest in such system uh, that would allow users to seek redress for their human rights. Uh, that is also a, a, a very interesting conversation that, that needs to continue uh, between, of course, the European authorities and, and, and companies, but also civil society organizations. That's, there's a lot of things that have been tried and that are still being tried to, uh, to try to, to answer this daunting question. Can we do a user redress mechanism at scale the same way we can do that uh, the same way we can moderate content at scale. Uh, all this to say that this will absolutely require, I don't think that the European Union itself can do it, can do all of this all alone. And I think the European Union is absolutely aware of that. We've seen a very unique exercise of collaboration, of um, dialogue with different stakeholders, including the international stakeholders, including uh, different nations uh, on this issue of you know how to make this 
democratic online speech space real. Uh, and uh, uh, but just to to close uh, this, this set of remarks, the oversight works is just one example of how a company can transfer transfer a decision making power uh, to an to an external body uh, of independent experts in a way that still prioritizes and places at the forefront users' rights and the leaks uh, the, the the decision on speech from financial interest of of the of the business. Regulation absolutely plays a, a very critical role. I personally believe in that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm not the ones who will tell you you know the laissez faire approach is the best one. Uh, uh, we've seen that, you know, we need to provide answers at some point, whether we are governments, whether we are companies, whether we are also civil society organizations, uh, but this will require a multi-stakeholder collaboration, uh, this, and the social media landscape changes so rapidly that there's absolutely no way that only one set of actors gets it right from the beginning. So just to, to, to summarize, yes, I do think that the, the PSA DMA are a, a leap forward, an important leap forward from where we were six years earlier. Um, and on the other hand, how it's going to impact internationally, I, I, I trust that it's going to, and it's opening already, very interesting conversations, very interesting um, uh, trials of, of what could be possible in terms of implementing this uh, very ambitious set of regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, I think just to also um, kind of situate us in where things are right now. So we've talked about in, in several different respects with both the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, which uh, companies, which products and services are affected by the more stringent regulations is about the number of users, the number of users in Europe in particular. Um, a very large online platform is one that offers a public service and has more than 45 million users in Europe um, because that's roughly 10% of the European population. Right now, at this very moment, many companies are, I believe, based on guidance that has been issued by the Commission, counting uh, their users. And there's a lot of questions about how do we count users the right way? How do we not double count users in order to figure out which companies will be uh, very large online platforms? Um, the deadline for that, uh, for publicly releasing those numbers, is uh, this month, February 17th. So. And that will then trigger what kinds of uh, additional requirements, transparency reporting, risk assessment, risk mitigation, audits, and much more companies will have to do as part of their compliance. Um, uh, Gerard, you've been in San Francisco for a few months now. Uh, what's been the reaction from the technology companies? Uh, and and, and wh where, where do you see them in this um, at this stage of beginning these kinds of collaborative discussions, not about what the law should be, but what about what, what does compliance with it look like? Well, I, I mean, it's hard to kind of in one word to kind of um, summarize what the reaction has been for kind of a, a great variety of um, big tech platforms also operating in, in different areas. But uh, I mean, I think in general, they are taking it seriously. Uh, and I think they do recognize that the negotiations are over. There's no point in, in, in reopening discussions. We're, we're in implementation mode. And uh, the, the regulator, I mean, the European Commission is the regulator, both for the very large online platforms for the Digital Services Act, as well as for the gatekeepers for the Digital Markets Act. I mean, the gate, this is kind of internal. That's, I think, uh, I think Julie said this morning, we're hiring like, crazy and so anybody who's looking for a job you need to have a, a european passport i'm afraid to add but you'd be very welcome to come and join a, a very fast growing team I, I i think the discussions are are, are i mean we've had a lot of what we call pre-designation uh, discussions because these companies will be designated there'll be official kind of decisions so to say look you are a very large online platform so that there's no kind of doubt about it and this will of course depend on the user numbers which we receive in 12 days the same for the gatekeepers they will be designated on the basis of a slightly more complicated uh, set of uh, of criteria um so the, 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 the so we've had many of the, the discussions pre-designation i mean uh, i think there was a little bit more attention initially maybe on the digital markets act because this is of course something that goes quite to the heart of the business model i think on the digital services act because i mean companies tend to think that the interests are aligned i mean who wants to be a purveyor of this information who wants to be kind of a, a channel for for terrorist content i mean no 
no platform would, would want to, to have that. So, so here, I mean, we want the same thing. I mean, maybe with the Digital Markets Act, there's a bit more differences of view about what we want. And, and some platforms are clearly unhappy with the Digital Markets Act. Interestingly, that there's also very big companies and other companies who are very happy about the Digital Markets Act. So it's definitely also not like a one size fits all. We get companies coming to us and say, oh, I really hate this provision. I mean, how can I comply, but I still hate it. And then they say, but that other provision, we really love it, but can you please make sure that the other company kind of fully complies with that other provision? So it's quite an interesting discussion on, on the Digital Services Act. I, I think the, I mean, we will, I mean, it will enter into force on the 1st of September. By that time, we will see also risk assessments. So they will have to kind of send us the risk assessments. I think what is interesting is also that, I mean, we're not regulating for the world per se, but of course, what is coming out of the regulation is of great, great interest to the world because like Emma and colleagues will have access to the transparency reports, to the risk assessment reports, I mean, auditing reports. I mean, we, were, we will try to be as generous as possible uh, for American researchers to benefit from the legal base under the DSA to get access to platform data. I mean, of course, there is still the criteria that it must be like within Europe. So if you do research on like, well, uh, US election interference, that's not something that you can get access to, but you you do research on like risk of election interference more generally. I think we'll be quite glad to have many American researchers who are outstanding in the in the conversation. So there will be benefits here more generally because this I mean we were, for example in the in the transparency reporting we don't know who the decisions who how decisions are taken who takes the decision that for example Trump can get back on Twitter we don't know how these decisions are taken It'd be quite useful to know how these decisions are taken how kind of particular cases are escalated what are the internal protocols who who kind of how, how we, what are the checks and balances in these systems companies will be required to report on that. How do they operate internally? So that's information that also for all of you, you, you can see. I think one question will be to what extent will the platforms themselves, which is also the question that we had with the GDPR, extend the benefits, because these are benefits, I mean, better treatment to Europeans, to what extent will they extend these benefits voluntarily to American citizens and other citizens of the world? That we don't know. Uh, I mean, there are certain requirements, for example, under the Digital Markets Act, side loading. Uh, these app stores will have to give an opportunity to download apps from not necessarily the app store that kind of is linked to your device. Will that kind of facility be made available to Americans or will there be app stores for Europeans that we don't know? Uh, we'll have to see. So, And that will then, I, I, I would guess, build up a little bit of pressure domestically where you will find out that kind of big tech companies that are headquartered in, in, in the US territory are is giving better treatment to Europeans kind of about whatever 10 hours flight away, at least from here. So that will create an interesting dynamic. But the discussion with the platforms are, are constructive. I think all of the platforms want to have a, a positive relationship with the regulator. I would be asking for the same or working towards the same. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the regulator. I think, but there are, of course, going to be issues. There are going to be some problems. I mean, that's that's inevitable. And then we'll get into an enforcement situation. And then, of course, some of these companies might be less happy with what, what happens next. But that's for the future. That's not today. Can I just add a quick note to that? Dave? Please. I, I fondly, there, there was commentary earlier about this sort of, I think, steady improvement in quality in congressional hearings on issues related to tech. Admittedly, there are still gaps and variability within that. Um, but in I think an early instance of that evolution four or so years ago, I very much remember a congressional panel with a bunch of big tech executives on the dais, and a member of Congress asked them, what about your implementation of the GDPR could you not just flip a switch and do for the United States? And there was no answer. Like, they couldn't give an answer. It was, an, it was an almost a possible question to answer. But, but I think that we're going to see that same reality play out as implementation mechanisms are built for these, these laws, the DSA and the DMA. Um, and we're going to see that same soft pressure, even in the absence of a law in the United States, to deploy many of those same things. And I want to pair that with Gerard being in San Francisco. Like, the time is now to start talking to them and trying to start helping with that implementation phase because it's going to have echoes here and in other places as well. I, 
think that that I would chime in and say, I think for things like risk assessment and transparency yes. and hopefully even researcher access to data, um, that that very well may bear out. Those are kinds of internal systems and processes that a company could create that might be relatively easy, although relatively expensive to, to kind of do for the US as well or for the rest of the world. I think we might see a very different response on the parts of the DSA that are about liability for illegal content, because what is illegal in different jurisdictions can actually be quite different. And there is a risk, I think, especially depending on how things go with the state social media laws that we've seen in the United States, that some of these services might find actually competing legal obligations around the same piece of content, where in the EU there are codes of practice and expectations that content that is illegal or very likely to be illegal should and ought to be taken down promptly, even without a court order. And that same content might be lawful in the US and expected under the law of Texas to remain on the service because it is not, in fact, illegal speech in the United States. We might see companies just respond the way they have for many years now of trying to do geo blocking and, and limit the access to illegal content in Europe, but leave it online in Texas and other parts of the US where they're required by law potentially to do so. But if European regulators push it and say it's like, yeah, but geoblocking is easy to circumvent and, and our law says you need to actually restrict access effectively in Europe to this content, we'll start seeing this kind of extraterritorial impact of the DSA on exactly what content is available to whom and where. So that is, I think, a big tension that we might expect to see, especially if the I mean, who knows what the Supreme Court's going to do if and when it looks at the Texas social media law. Um, but that is that is a tension that I, I think could create a lot of challenges for for online services and also users trying to figure out where can they actually post speech that is lawful in their country. So I, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind, because this is such a voluminous <laughs> set of package of regulations, um, that for folks who, for, who are not steeped in the, the DSA and the DMA, to focus in on those components that, have, that resonate with proposals that have been discussed, whether at, in Congress, um, uh, at the state level, um, when it comes to things like transparency reporting, when it comes to researcher access to data, uh, when it comes to risk assessments and audits, there are, there's a lot of individual pieces of this regulation that I would encourage folks to look at. Um, that said, this is a um, fairly onerous, fairly he heavyweight set of regulations in that it, and, and there is also, of course, um, the, the commission uh, will have supervisory fees based on the size of platforms to help fund all of those teams that, that Gerard just mentioned they're hiring. Is this approach, is this amount of kind of um, volume of, of oversight something that is re replicable elsewhere? Um, I, I believe it, uh, Taiwan last year actually considered some legislation or regulation that looks a lot like the DSA and then uh, opted not to pursue this approach because hearing from domestic industry in Taiwan that this was gonna be too much for them to handle. Um, I'm, I'm just curious whether, whether you think that uh, there are any challenges around the replicability of the kind of level of capacity that the commission will bring to this, but that others may be challenged uh, to bring to these issues for the panel. I mean, this is this is sophisticated. I mean, again, you would expect me to say this, but I mean, this is complicated, sophisticated regulation. This is not regulation that kind of you can give to a country like Indonesia or a country in Africa or Latin America and say, now you implement it. This is just I mean, the, the, the capacity is not there. I mean, the European Union can do that. That's why we are kind of quite this modular approach, or as you sketched it, I mean, there are certain elements that definitely, I think, make sense. I mean, and not so complicated, like the transparency, the risk management. I mean, we've seen some bills on the Hill were actually taken our language quite happy. There's no copyright on it, just uh, on, on these, <laughs> these issues. So that, that, I think, is probably the way forward globally. I don't think any country will very, I mean, in the near future, take just the DSA lock, stock and barrel and put it on the national statute book, at least because it's complicated. You need to have the the capacities in place, also regulatory enforcement capacity. We're building this up. We must also not underestimate. We are going to be the first regulator in the world to, to do this kind of stuff. So we are not certainly not underestimating kind of the challenge that for ourselves. I mean, in terms of administrative burdens, I mean, yes, of course. I mean, but we're talking about very important issues. I mean, you look at pharmaceuticals, banks, and everything, there's some administrative burdens, but it's important that these industries are regulated because 
we don't want kind of the burdens to, as we have seen with the financial crisis. I mean, uh, if you don't regulate them, then the burdens kind of affect the whole of society and all of our economies. If, if people wouldn't feel secure about, say, the safety of drugs, we'd have a major problem here. So this is, it's absolutely, um, in our view, as Europeans, it's, it's absolutely kind of proportionate and, and, and necessary. These companies are also not poor, exactly. So they can, I mean, you talked about the supervisory fee. I mean, we're talking about... 10, 12 million euros per year. I think that Facebook and, and all the others will probably survive. I don't think this will kind of be noticed. This is pocket money for these companies. So, and it's, it's in their own interest in a way. I mean, these companies, we talked a lot to them and they say, we want to be trusted because if the users don't trust us, they don't come to us. If the advertisers don't trust us, we don't sell any advertising anymore, our whole business model. So maybe on the DMA, again, it's, it's different, but here we zoom in on a very small population, probably of 10, 15 gatekeepers. And, and this is where kind of the consumer welfare is, is much greater and the, the, the innovation. I mean, this sector is not as innovative as it used to be. I mean, look at the, the, the way that kind of the, the, I mean, look at inter, I mean, the interpersonal uh, kind of communication services. I mean, what's the innovation in, 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 in like WhatsApp, et cetera? It's not, in this, there can be a lot more innovation in this sector if you open up the market and others can compete. This is a market that is not competitive. So the benefits far outweigh, and of course you'd need to look at costs always, which we've done, but it's equally important to look at the benefits and we are convinced that the benefits far outweigh the cost. So I'm, I'm mindful of the time, uh, and I want to make sure we save uh, time for audience questions. I want to just check and see if anybody has any a, a quick response to Gerard on that, including you, Julie. Uh, yeah, yes, no, no, thank you. I, that, that question is extremely central because it's, there's one aspect uh, that, that, we, that I probably didn't insist enough uh, in, in my previous response, which is uh, the, the, why is it important that there is at least a common agreement on um, what what can be done, what should be done when it comes to um, limiting the negative effects of, uh, you know, the, the current status quo. Uh, it is even more important because when you think about it, uh, the, the international interconnectivity of harmful content in European Union and other places of the world, and one very good example of that, I think, is the what is happening what has happened with the war in Ukraine. Here we had a very united European Union that uh, offered responses to uh, waves of disinformation, um, false, false uh, narratives about, about the, the war. But at the same time, that same power was offering uh, false narratives too, uh, to international partners, very important national, international partners of the European Union, which are located further south on the African continent. So, and, and it came to a, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a situation in which uh, you had, uh, it was important, it is still important for allies of Ukraine, for Ukraine itself to make sure to have allies beyond the European uh, Union borders, because this war is of course happening on the European territory, but it concerns us all. Uh, and so we had the situation in which the, 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 the Russian propaganda and disinformation is thriving in uh, several markets, several countries in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, which have very real consequences on the international front and particularly on the, on the issue of this, of this conflict of the Ukrainian war. So hence the importance of having, and that is where probably some of the challenges that you were alluding to, David, might uh, come come to play and, and require this international cooperation, even on the, you know, on, on, on the understanding of what is behind the DSA, on having the possibility of being modular about it, because obviously a regulator in Niger, for instance, probably cannot implement everything, but yet this regulator in Niger is facing exactly the same questions as a regulator in France, for instance, with regards to, uh, you know, content that is disrupting peace uh, security, including international security, uh, being uh, by targeting this, this very small country in Africa. So I just wanted to, um, yes, to, to to tie this to uh, this broader 
question. Very, very well said, Julie. Really appreciate you spelling that out for us and the, the interdependencies among countries here. So we're pressed for time, and I think we have time for one question. So we are going to do invoke the Phil Weiser rule once again uh, and look for a question from a student. Hi, my name is Christine. I am a PhD student in computer science here at CU Boulder. Um, my question does assume that there exists some urgency in implementing uh, regulations, um, but given that if, if your three-stage process um, is accurate, um, and even if it's not, uh, there might be incentive for other governments to kind of wait and see how things play out before they really take concerted action. Um, even though we are decidedly in the middle of multiple crises. Uh, so what do you think is necessary to motivate other governments to take action? Um, or, or if perhaps there's not urgency, I would love to hear that. And um, yeah, like should the US just wait for the, the DMA and DSA to kind of play out and see what happens? I think that's a great question and one that we can perhaps use for all the panelists to give their sort of parting 30 seconds. Perfect, yeah, totally agreed. I will note for context that uh, in next year in 2024, there are elections in the US, the EU, the UK, India. I mean, a significant number of countries are facing um, really interesting and challenging political moments right now. And that is a factor in these conversations as well. Um, but to, to build in and respond as well to what, to what Julie so hopefully articulated and what Gerard said, um, the more that we can build structures of collaboration and alignment in this space, even in advance of other laws besides the DSA being adopted, the more we can reduce some of those forward-looking enforcement costs that are otherwise going to be a real burden for, for both governments and companies going forward, um, and the, the better the outcome will be because we will reinforce more of the idea that the internet is global, is supposed to be global, and the better version of what that global, open, accountable internet sort of picture and system we can present to the world as a contrast to the authoritarian vision. Because I think that we have so much more in common in the problems we're trying to solve and the ways that we're trying to solve them um, than we have different in, in many of these countries, including very much in Niger. Um, and, and, and anyway, there's, there's a lot of opportunity now. And I think, I think very much a, um, a, a, a moment of crisis to, to start collaborating more than necessarily to rush to put a whole bunch of different laws out there, but to start collaborating in this shared problem space. We're collaborating enormously with kind of, we spend so much time kind of, uh, I mean, of course, on the DSA and the DMA, because indeed it probably makes a little bit of sense to make sure that it works. I mean, if I were another government, I'd probably also kind of see, well, how is this pudding tasting? Uh, and it's not going to be long. I mean, we're, we're talking here about well, 205 days before it enters into, into force. And so I think by the end of the year, the middle of next year, we'll have a pretty good idea how it's working and we'll try to continue to improve it. So we're working very closely with governments around the world. We have digital partnerships with a lot of countries around the world. I mean, just by way of example, we, are, we will have um, FTC staff. Uh, we're, we're offering them to join uh, also the European Commission. We do staff exchanges. So any possibility to kind of have this cross-fertilization to talk to countries around the world so that we don't invent or, or reinvent uh, the wheel if there's already a wheel. And, and when we come up with different approaches, at least we try to make them as consistent as, as possible. So this is the, the approach we take and we'll have to see kind of what we will first have to make a success of the DSA and the DMA. So I will sound a note of caution against countries kind of racing to just implement the, the DSA framework. I think it's really important to recognize that the DSA is coming in a very particular legal framework um, in the European Union around the kind of structures pr uh, promoting the rule of law in the EU and also um, respect for human rights. And the European Convention on Human Rights setting out, you know, a relatively clear with a very robust set of case law from the European Court of Human Rights that is essential legal foundation for what the DSA is building on top of. That structure does not exist in all countries around the world. It's not even, we're not even going to get the same answers on some of the questions of fundamental rights like freedom of expression. For example, in the United States, there are absolutely aspects of the DSA that would just, at least under current understandings of the First Amendment, be unconstitutional. Um, so I think there are some significant 
limits and necessary limits to exactly how can different countries transpose aspects of the DSA into national law, and some elements of the DSA that, frankly, in Europe, I am concerned about how they will play out, including things like the, the local presence obligation that's part of the DSA, requiring there to be staff based in Europe. Very understandable, also part of the GDPR. It's all about ensuring that Europe can actually enforce its laws on com companies that are have their headquarters in the United States. Um, but having potential liability for individual staff and requiring them to be within the reach of law enforcement in a country is something that we have seen Russia use to great effect in making sure that the Alexander Navalny smart voting app got kicked out of app stores days before the Russian uh, elections um, about two years ago. Uh, it's something that we're seeing the Indian government use in the similar provision in their IT rules um, to try to coerce certain content moderation decisions out of Twitter and other social media services. So some of these ideas when exported out of the European context and even potentially as used in the European context um, start raising enormous human rights concerns. Uh, and so that's where I think some caution is also very much warranted. Julie, 30 seconds. Yes, yeah, 30 seconds. Build, building up on, on what uh, my colleagues Emma and Chris have rightly said, uh, I think there was absolutely room for um, adaptability and modularity. And what would be extremely encouraging is providing answers in the form of, I don't know, a declaration, an agreement, on specifically what makes uh, a democratic content moderation, what, what gives the impression and the reality of rule of law on online spaces so that any country can inspire themselves from this set of, of declarations and principles and then transform them into their uh, national, uh, within the national realities. That is a conversation that I hope the DSA, the DMA and the European Union will start with counterparts in the United States and also, of course, in uh, what is called the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And let me just say with one tiny bit of self-promotion. So in order to have the type of global conversation uh, that we've talked about, we need to have a common vocabulary. My organization, the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, has published a glossary of trust and safety terminology, content moderation terminology, so that we understand the terms that we're using. We published that for public consultation. So I want to encourage folks to take a look at that. Tell us what you think about how we've defined terms. Um, and then um, uh, with that, Thank you to our panel. Uh, this was uh, terrific. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope the audience did as well. And uh, thanks very much.